Erickson and the Holographic Theory of Mind. Part 84, the hamster wheel of AI. So large language models, we're going back to a knowledge database back in the 60s. And we need episodic memory and, well, a whole lot of other things. So let's take a look. I can make this very quick. AI is, an, is in an infinite loop. So they started with knowledge bases and deduction, say the 1960s to roughly the 1980s, or good old fashioned AI. But this was considered a fail, wasn't getting there. So we went to statistics, statistical inference, induction, 1990s roughly to now. But now they're starting to see we need to go back again. This is the new target, knowledge, knowledge basis and deduction. But we'll look a little more into it. This talk caught my eye. What's wrong with large language models? Well, what we should be doing instead or building instead? This is by Thomas Dietrich, who is a emeritus professor of computer science at Oregon State University, pioneer in machine learning, executive editor of the journal Machine Learning, co-founded the journal Machine Learning Research. Talk, at least was just posted uh, July 2023 at a conference in Spain, Valencia. So what does Dr. D have to say? Well, Dr. D notes the pleasant surprise and the capabilities of these new models, given their base in recurrent neural networks, which are networks simply tuned to predicting the next word. So a whole lot of came out of that simple base or simple basis. Carry out conversations and answer questions covering a wide range of human knowledge. As he says, our first case or our first case of creating a broadly knowledgeable AI system. Additional capabilities, summarize and revise documents, write code like Python and Scale, Excel. Learn new tasks from a small number of training samples via in-context learning. But the problems. Well, first he notes, they give self-contradictory answers. Take the little thing in yellow there. So he, the GP2, this is GP2, was asked to write a, uh, a little story um, based on that prompt there. Uh, and shocking finding, and a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. So continue that story. So they said the scientist, GPT said, the scientists named the population after the distinctive horn of its unicorn. These four horned silver white unicorns. So as you can see, it can't keep itself straight within the same sentence. There's other things like accusation based on events, totally made up by the GPT down in the corner there. GPT wrongly accuses law professor of sexual assault or citing non-existent references, references that made up. In other words, are also known as hallucinations, a major problem. Um, Dr. D says maybe better stochastic inference or probabilistic invention. Only the most recent version of GPT-4, he notes, with special training is able to achieve only a 40% rate of um, hallucinations in its answers. So, Probably improved a bit since then, but still, still a problem. Some more problems. This one here, the training, the retraining and inference are extremely expensive. Note the 700,000 per day to operate. Um, and then knowledge cannot be easily updated because it's so expensive. Facts are stored in the network weight, so we have to rerun the system. And another. Poor non linguistic knowledge. So we look at that little query there given to a, a chat GPT. There's a square room. Alice is staying in the northwest corner. Bob is staying in the southwest corner. Charlie is staying in the southeast corner. David is staying in the northeast corner. Ed is staying in the center of the room looking at Alice. How many people are there in the room? And the GPT answers correctly five. But then we, we go on to the next one. There is a square room who is standing to the left of Ed. And um, 
It answers, Alice is standing to the left of Ed. Okay, but that's incorrect. Bob is standing to the left of Ed. And as Dr. D notes, in order for us to answer this, we almost have to make a little diagram where we've got the five people there. We have Ed facing Alice. And then, then we can see that, indeed, um, it's Bob that's standing to the left of Ed as looking at Alice. So not necessarily greatest spatial representation or imagination or imagery going on in the GPT. Now he wonders maybe GPT-4 trained with the images can do better. Well, I would doubt that, but we'll move on. The core problem, as uh, Dr. D notes, large language models are not knowledge bases. Rather, they are probabilistic models of knowledge bases. So back to my circle, we're going back to knowledge bases, ultimately deduction. Dr. D explains it thus. So if we look over at the picture here and look at that database, you've got uh, four people listed, Phil Knight in Oregon, Mark Zuckerberg in California, Sunder in California, and Mark Benioff in California. And we ask or make a query, what state does Karen Lynch work in? Well, for the database, that's unknown because Karen Lynch isn't in the database. But a probabilistic model, given that California is 75%, Oregon's only 25%, uh, we're going to guess that uh, Karen lives in, uh, in California. The correct answer, of course, is Rhode Island. But uh, if we're simply basing our, our knowledge guesses, again, one of those hallucinations on the statistics, we'll, we'll say, well, Karen, best, best shot is she, she lives in California. So he says we want knowledge bases and not statistical models of knowledge bases. So the LLMs have a statistical model of a knowledge base. And when it doesn't know the answer, it will just synthesize one that is hallucinating. Of course, that's why it's called generative AI. So he discusses a few current band-aids on this. Retrieval augmented models using query input to fetch external documents, knowledge graphs that, that help it along, or self-refinement, the model critiques its own output, or multimodal networks try to train the text to images. It's clear he considers these all as band-aids. To him, this is the real fix. We must go modular. And he notes that reference on the bottom. We'll take a look at that in a second, but it's looking at the picture there. You see the modules, the planning module, metacognition, formal reasoning, language understanding and generation as opposed to common sense knowledge, as opposed to factual world knowledge, and there's episodic memory, and there's a situation model. So looking at modules, now that reference, Mahowald, very recent, January of 2023, and by linguistics and computer science folks, three offers. Dissociating language and thought in large language models, a cognitive perspective. So dissociating language and thought, that is, we want to break out language from thought, or maybe from knowledge and thought involving knowledge. Here's an abstract. This is the abstract on it. Uh, and then if you note down there, about midway down in the purple, that they're saying that functional competence, not just linguistic competence, recruits multiple extra linguistic capacities that comprise human thoughts, such as formal reasoning, world knowledge, situation modeling, and social cognition, always a big problem for the um, LLMs because they don't like them saying uh, non-appropriate uh, things. Look at the red sentence. Based on this evidence, we argue that one contemporary LLM should be taken seriously as models of formal linguistic skills, but two, they need to add in all this other, other stuff, non-language specific cognitive capacities. So Mahowald argued that the brain has the separate function shown, we've already discussed. 
But today's large language models combined all three into one component, the, the three in the, in the um, beige box there. Language understanding, common sense knowledge, and factual world knowledge. And this is part of the problem. We can't update the world knowledge because it's all mixed in with the language knowledge, says Dr. D. He's not concerned about common sense knowledge because that doesn't change too much. It's the factual knowledge that he's worried about, which is, I'm just going to say, a complete misconception as to what knowledge actually is. They also talk about the need for an episodic memory there and a situation model. Like when we read a narrative or a story, we build a situation model, which is a model of the characters and events. Now, to me, this is just simply another form of episodic memory being created in the mind by reading the text, all of which the understanding thereof is all dependent on our primary episodic memory, that is, via our experience. And the uh, imagery created while we're reading is just part of our mental experience. I, there's not a whole lot of difference here. But Dr. D says it's very clear that large language models do not have episodic memory. LLMs have a context buffer, roughly about 32,000 words long or something like that. That's the input to the model. And once something falls off out of the buffer, it's gone. And it's gone. So here we allude to the prefrontal cortex, these boxes, planning, formal reasoning, and especially metacognition, self-monitoring, or orchestration. So the AIs are starting to think, well, maybe mm, something from this whole literature of cognitive psychology about prefrontal cortex may be um, important. And Dr. D notes a paper, an amusing paper, he says, large language models need a prefrontal cortex. I've not seen that paper. And he notes the distinction between system one and system two, an, an old distinction between 18, 1987 by Shuri and Schachter, where system one is procedural memory or, or just motor memory, and system two is episodic memory or experiences, two different forms of memory conceived to be within the brain, a motor-based memory, memory of action, memory of learning how to play a, a waltz on the piano versus all the experiences about practicing, as I've noted. And he says, we train our large language models essentially at or as system one. That is, well, we're not, we have no episodic memory. The way forward, he says, is to break out the world knowledge and maybe the common sense knowledge, maybe, from the language component and episodic memory and situation modeling and coordinate formal reasoning and planning, also modules, with our understanding. Now, if we step back, that is such a massive, the complex statement, such a massive effort, because once you realize what the literature involves, the uh, top of your skull blows off. Uh, but, they, but yet this is said as though this is going to be possible. And then, then he says, if we do that, we can overcome all the shortcomings of large language models. So I'll say, except for one thing, large language models can't see the coffee being stirred. That is, they have no experience of it. This is the basis of common sense knowledge. But if you have no image of the external world, you have no sentience. Our image of the external world, watching and stirring that coffee, is our sentience. And these models have no sentience. They have no experience. But no, if they have no experience, how are they ever going to do episodic memory? because they have no experiences. Episodic memory is the four-dimensional memory, shall we say, of our experience. Consider what is being said here in Mahawal et al. Based on this evidence, we argue that one, contemporary LLMs should be taken seriously as models of formal linguistic skills. 
And then in the blue, they want to add on all these non-linguistic capabilities for thought, knowledge. But what are these contemporary LLMs? What are they based on? Remember, they're just vectors, word vectors. Note the larger the dot product value, as we've noted, the closer in the vector space. So we're so there's a, a larger um, product of bank and money, and they're closer in the vector space. How do they get that vector space? By taking the probabilities of the um, relationships of all words to every other word in, in their um, corpus. So in other words, it's world knowledge, quote unquote, is a mass of separate words as vectors. Each element in the vector is the probability of that word being related to every other word in the corpus. In other words, 500 words, each vector has a 500 probability, 500 probability elements. Not 2D as in the picture, but 500D. And GPTs are using millions of words. Monstrous vector space. But that is the basis of their knowledge. And when you add in the attention mechanism for a given uh, sentence, like he swam the river to reach the other bank up there, they basically do this. They they adjust that original vector space to pull bank closer to water to enable better answering of the sentences. Like, well, why did the guy swim to the other bank to deposit his money? No, because he needed to get to the physical dirt bank of the river. But that's all this is based on. This is now considered the default model of language understanding, however, to include Therefore, the storage of words as vectors, I mean, when you consider this, it's amazing. They're actually saying we should, we should uh, treat this with um, respect as a model of what the brain does. If I were back in 1975 and someone described the basic architecture of GPTs slash LOMs and said, in 50 years, this, this will be considered a model of the brain, I would have fallen on the floor. And now 50 years later, I see cognitive scientists and neuroscientists, Mahawadal, making the insightful observation, maybe we need to add episodic memory, real world knowledge and some prefrontal stuff. Well, I'm still on the floor. So Dr. D goes back to knowledge bases. Knowledge graphs. He says, we've been doing this for many decades. So you see this knowledge graph back there. Where he's taking that Wikipedia entry on KTNV TV channel. It's a television station in Las Vegas, Nevada, owned by such and such, licensed by such and such. And, and he's turned that into a graph where, you know, for scripts is owned, uh, television is the owner etc. So you got various relations, etc. Yep, they've been doing this for many decades. Here he's got a random page from Wiki, as I noticed, as a, as a knowledge graph. And then he wants to integrate with the large language model, where currently the encoding phase is taking next word probabilities, as we've noted. So he, he wants to uh, integrate as the next word capabilities with these knowledge graphs to uh, help it along, we'll say. He knows previous efforts along these lines. For example, Nell, never-ending learning, which extracted triples from text. There's a whole pile of triples there. In fact, here's a triple right there. Toronto, the hometown of the Maple Leafs. So that's a triple. There's triples all over in that in that picture. So. It collected and integrated evidence in favor of and against each triple, extended its initial ontology, inferred new relationships and their arguments and argument restrictions, and ran for 2010, eight years, 2010 to 2018. So is it time for another now, but using large language models, he asked. He wonders if a GPT could bootstrap this and in other words, build those models himself. So you take that paragraph about the TV station, 
and you, your prompt right there is read the following paragraph, that paragraph, and then turn it into simple relations, which uh, the GPT did there. K KTN VTV is a television station, it's located in Los Angeles, etc. Now you can imagine even this is a Sisyphean task because can you imagine taking every paragraph and millions and trillions of lines of text and treating it as a prompt to create this um, knowledge graph of triples? Yeah, that should be interesting. I, I suppose you could automate that, but here's the problem. It's not knowledge in, in any case. He knows a few other approaches to integrating GPTs with knowledge graphs. He knows, for example, a psych project. They encountered this problem. That is, they could not maintain global consistency. So the psych project was Doug Lennon. Uh, this consisted of manual entry into a database of the infinity of facts that humans seem to know. Like roads are flat, cars drive on roads, cars have wheels, et cetera, et cetera. This too was a Sisyphean task. Uh, the database massively unwieldy with no end in sight. And I, I noted an author that we talked about on AI, Eric Larson, worked on this. Uh, what is he, what's meant by not maintaining global consistency? I hadn't seen this particular discussion before. Uh, I was just familiar with the fact that it just became so unwieldy as to be un, unworkable. But I think we can intuit it. Um, he notes they adopted micro rules, so we probably need to do this as well. well. Why did they need to do that? Well, here's a triple. Cars drive rows. Not the best triple, but and golfers drive golf balls. Another triple based on tribe. Do cars drive golf balls? Hmm. Well, maybe we need to go to a micro world, the golfing micro world versus the car driving micro world to keep this straight. Here's another better one, though. Dogs drive sheep. And golfers drive golf balls. So do dogs drive golf balls? Hmm, probably need a micro world, but you can see where this is going. Here's the problem. This is not knowledge. That is, it's not the experience. It's not the experience of driving golf balls. It's not the experience of herding sheep. It's not the experience of driving cars. It's why a, a, a neural net can classify a parked car that's sitting on top of a concrete divider as a parked car when anyone who's driven a car knows you can't possibly park on top of the divider but it doesn't because it's not none of this graph stuff triples abstract relationships is real knowledge and he proposes that ai not only answer would give an argument justifying its answer noting there's been a lot of work in ai in the structure of argument in other words yep we're going back to deduction so that was the whole notion, deduction from databases. And of course, he notes that not all knowledge is triples. For example, he says, actions that can be taken in the world where your preconditions, results, and side effects, and cost. But see, this is a finite list of, of every action possible on the world and every precondition is not possible. The possible transformations are indefinite, infinite. This is a hidden attempt to formalize abduction, as we talked about in a, in a previous video, the, the, the nature of abduction, which can't be formalized. There was a, an AI attempt, uh, the ALP, Abductive Learning Project, to try to formalize induction or deduct, yeah, abduction. It cannot be done. For, various, for reasons we discussed, but they need abduction, but you can't formalize it. It's going to relate to this here. Ongoing processes like water flowing or filling a container or battery discharging, well, or stirring coffee, an ongoing process. But what defines coffee stirring in an invariant structure? with velocity flow fields, adiabatic ratios, etc., inertial tensors, AI 
has yet no clue as to the importance of this, the absolutely critical foundational importance of this is the structure of knowledge, experience knowledge. My experience of storing that coffee is defined by all this, all these um, invariance laws. They haven't even begun to go there. But that's the problem. That's, that's the nature of experience, which you're now going to try to store as episodic memory. But how do you do that? in as a set of triples or anything else. AI is in the wrong metaphor. Going back to knowledge databases and deduction combined with enumerative induction, this is not going to save them. They have no theory of perception, the origin of the image of the external world. That is our experience, our, our sentience of the coffee being stirred again. If our experience of seeing that coffee being stirred and feeling it and moving our hands is not sentience, I don't know what it is. The image of the external world, its origin, the problem thereof, is the problem of sentience. With no theory of experience, they cannot know how it is stored, how to store experience. Therefore, no possibility of understanding episodic memory. And of course, they have no clue that those ongoing processes are defined by invariance laws. Laws defined over a 40 extent of the continuous indivisible flow of time. Finally, when they are starting to realize that they need a prefrontal cortex for planning, for reasoning, they've run smack into Piaget's unbelievably complex developmental trajectory, supported the development. Just looking at the first two years thereof of explicit memory, the symbolic function, and cost, that is our concepts of causality, object, space, and time, and thus underlying language. And we're going to carry that trajectory on through at least year 12, if not more. They have to embrace all of that. They don't know what, they're, what, they're, what they think they're just going to throw into large language models and save the day. So here's Dr. D's last slide. We should be building modular AI systems separate linguistic skill from world knowledge, etc. Have episodic memory, create and update world knowledge. No need to worry about common sense knowledge. Clueless there. And then the last sentence, there are many, many details to be worked out. Yes, the entirety of cognitive psychology and developmental psychology now has to be worked out. Yep, massive details. AI has a choice. Explore a new metaphor or stay on their wheel. So next we'll see. Till then, signing off.